你好。All right, good. Uh, 我学了中文，可是我的中文不好。So I will be speaking in English. 对不起。Uh, I'm Charles Nutter. I'm going to speak to you today a little bit about uh, some future things happening on the JVM. Hopefully, get you excited about where the platform is going. Show you that、uh, Java is certainly not dead. It's it's more alive and more exciting than it's ever been.、Uh, so let's get to it.、Uh, There's my basic contact information. Feel free to email me anytime.、Uh, contact me on Twitter.、Uh, we also have Gitter channels for JRuby. We're on IRC. Lots of different ways to find me.、Uh, so I've been working on JRuby.、Uh, I am one of the the two JRuby guys.、Uh, about ten years ago, we started really working hard on it.、Uh, and I, I can't really talk about the JVM and my experience on the platform. Without talking about JRuby and what it's what we've done over the years, the work we've had to do.、Uh, so of course JRuby is Ruby on top of the Java platform, Ruby running on the JVM.、Uh, we tell the Rubyists that it's just Ruby. Pay no attention to that Java that's under there. Don't don't look at that. But for all of you, it's Ruby running alongside all of the JVM languages you like, all of the libraries you use. Uh, so everything you do with Java or Scala, you can do with Ruby, and you can use Rails and other libraries out there too. And it's actually a fairly old project.、Uh, JRuby was started in 2001,、uh, very very early on in the JVM language world. In about 2005, we decided that we should really try to make JRuby run Rails. That was when Rails came out. It was changing the way web development was done. People were very excited about it. If we have JRuby, why not have JRuby on Rails and run Rails on top of Java?、Uh, and that carried us well ten years of work that we've put into JRuby, making it run Rails well, making it run fast.、Uh, and our our latest release, JRuby 9000, is compatible with the current version of Ruby. It's the fastest Ruby available, and you can deploy Ruby applications in the Java server on a Java platform anywhere you want. So we've we've worked very hard. For all these years to make JRuby work well,、uh, this is just a demonstration of how much work has gone into this. This is、uh, probably most of these commits in the past 10 years, almost 30,000 commits that have happened.、Uh, you can figure that out. There's a lot of work being done during that time. 3,000 commits per year during that time.、Uh, obviously, many commits per day on average. So lots of work. And why have we wanted to do this? Why did we spend all this time working on JRuby? It's just Ruby, right? Why, why couldn't we work on something else? Why do J- JRuby for ten years? Well, the bottom line is we do really like Ruby. First of all, you would kind of have to like Ruby to work on JRuby for ten years.、Uh, so we like the language, we like the community, and the things that you can do with Ruby. But we also like the JVM. We're not going to leave the JVM. We're J- JVM developers, Java developers. Even though we like other languages like Ruby and Python, we like the platform too. So that's kind of a conundrum for us. How do we make this platform designed for Java be good for Ruby as well, and do everything that Ruby needs it to do? And I think it's worth taking a step back to talk about what is the JVM? What is the platform that we're trying to target with JRuby?、Uh, so is it an enterprise platform? Well, traditionally, over the past 10, 15 years, that's kind of where it's landed.、Uh, if you wanted to build large-scale enterprise applications, the JVM, Java EE, it, all of that was typically where you would end up building applications. So, enterprise is associated with the JVM, but really, it's not—it's not really an enterprise platform. That's just one application, one use of the JVM.、Uh, so, is it just a Java platform? Well, to some extent, it's it's focused around Java. Most applications written for the JVM are written in Java, but there's also all these new languages. There's languages written for the JVM, like Scala, Clojure, Groovy.、Uh, there's languages from other platforms that have come to the JVM, like Python and Ruby, and JavaScript. So it's not just about Java anymore either.、Uh, so maybe it's only managed languages, garbage collected languages. Uh, all of the languages I listed,、uh, you don't manually allocate objects and throw them away.、Uh, you you use a garbage collector. You run within a, a contained world, a virtual machine. But、uh, the JVM isn't really just managed language either.、Uh, 
uh, graphics libraries, Swing, all of those have to call out to the operating system. Working with the file system has to call native libraries. Uh, there's lots of things that the JVM does for us that mean native code is happening somewhere. It needs to call down to the system. So it's not even just those managed languages on top. So really, the JVM is just kind of this magic box that runs our code. We throw applications at it. It draws graphics for us. It does I.O. for us. It makes things optimize well, cleans up memory, and it all works right, except when it doesn't. And that's where we really have the interesting aspects of JRuby. That's where the interesting work that we've done on JRuby comes to play. The JVM is not designed for Ruby. It's not designed for Scala. It's not designed for Groovy. So we need to find a way to fit those languages into the JVM, and more importantly, what this talk is about, fit the JVM to those languages. All right, so Ruby. How many folks are familiar with Ruby as a language? I see maybe one or two hands. Okay, so I've got a little, little intro to Ruby here. Good to have that. Uh, so Ruby is actually much older than Java, uh, originally created in 1995, envisioned a little bit earlier than that, but released in 1995 by Yukihiro Matsumoto of Japan. Uh, it's a dynamically typed language, so similar to Groovy without static types, JavaScript, and so on. It is an object-oriented language, uh, like most of the languages on the JVM are in some way. Uh, and more interestingly, everything is an object. There's no representation of a primitive integer or a primitive long. Everything is an object in memory. You can call objects on numbers and so on. Uh, one of the defining things about Ruby is its tight integration with the native platform. It's very much grown up in a Unix world. Um, a lot of the calls, a lot of the work that you do in Ruby, you'll be doing, you could do the same thing in C with a lot more code, but designed around integrating with the native platform, integrating with a Unix POSIX environment. Uh, and now, object-oriented isn't too difficult. We're working on an object-oriented platform with the JVM. Uh, but these other three items are a little tricky. Doing dynamic languages on top of the JVM, uh, the fact that we're creating a lot more objects in Ruby than in most other languages, uh, and integrating well with the native platform. And these are the three areas that were really a challenge for us in JRuby. To make Ruby as compatible as possible, we needed to find a way to solve these problems. Here's a little example of Ruby code. Uh, this is a longer hello world than necessary, but shows some of the structure of Ruby. We create a class, hello. Uh, we have a constructor. Constructor is always called initialize in Ruby. The constructor assigns uh, a field, an instance variable called name, and fields always have an app symbol in front of them, so you can recognize them. We also define a display method here that prints out hello name and shows you that Ruby has string interpolation. You can insert objects into the string directly. Down at the bottom, constructing a new instance of hello is just calling a new method on hello. Hello.new gives us an object. And then hello.display. So we want to be able to run code like this. Very clean looking, beautiful code for the Ruby folks in the world. Rails designed around a lot of wonderful Ruby features. We want to be able to run this on top of the JVM. So the first challenge, as I mentioned, dynamic calls uh, and lots and lots and lots of them. Ruby does many, many more method calls uh, in a typical application than you would, typic than you would see in a, a standard Java app. So here's a, a chart showing some basic things you might do with JRuby. Uh, JRuby-e1, just executing a simple script on the command line. Uh, executes 1,000 method calls just to boot up Ruby and basically do almost nothing, just to boot Ruby itself. Uh, installing the Rails libraries, 3, 315,000 method calls done. Uh, in creating a new application, generating a new Rails app, 600,000 method calls. And then even just a simple Rails view, loading a, a simple list of objects out of the database, 16,000 method calls, every single request. Obviously, we need to make these things fast, and we need to find a way to do it that fits into the JVM. So here's a, a little example of a simple method call chain. We've got the foo method, calling the bar method, calling baz, and so on, uh, like you would see in any typical Ruby code. And these are all dynamic calls. So traditionally, it's, uh, it's standard in, in standard JRuby, we need to have some extra logic in there. The JVM doesn't know how to do dynamic calls, 
So we have our own JRuby call logic in between each of these. Uh, the JVM will run our code, look up the method, and then proceed from foo to bar and bar to baz. But the problem is all of this extra logic here breaks many JVM optimizations. It can't see through our lookups. It can't see through our tables of methods to optimize it like it would Java. And that's where Invoke Dynamic comes in. So Invoke Dynamic is the first big new JVM feature I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so a little history. The JVM was never really designed to run multiple languages. But in the original specification, the JVM authors did say, at some point, maybe the JVM might be able to do things other than Java, but definitely focused on Java. And so as new languages came around, or new features we wanted on the platform, sometimes they didn't really fit. Not a good fit for the platform. Dynamic typing, some of the features of Ruby, calling native code, lots of things that we need to do to support these other languages just weren't designed into the platform. Uh, here is actually a quote from the original JVM specification. In the future, we will consider bounded extensions to the Java virtual machine to provide better support for other languages. And now this never really happened until mid-2000s when we came along with JRuby and started to work on the JVM. Nothing really changed at the JVM level for about 10 years or so. Then we came along and JRuby needed more out of the JVM. Standard JVM, standard Java, was not good enough for us to build a good Ruby implementation. So Invoke Dynamic was the project that we had to work on. Invoke Dynamic creates a new bytecode, adds a new bytecode to the JVM after 10 years of it existing, many years of no new bytecodes. Uh, it has an API for method pointers, fast method pointers, wrappers for those pointers, be able to wire up calls much faster than reflection APIs, direct pointers to functions. Uh, some logic for caching, invalidation, things that the JVM does internally, lift it up as an API that we can use for building languages. Uh, and ideally, make, we wanted to make this flexible enough so that not just Ruby would run well, but future languages would work well. Groovy would be able to use it. JavaScript would be able to use it. Uh, even Java itself might be able to get some benefit from this. So how does Invoke Dynamic work? What is, what is this thing that we're talking about? Uh, so on the JVM, there are various ways that you can call a method, the way, various ways you can invoke. Uh, and they boil down to four categories. We have static method invocations, like calling current time milliseconds, or calling any of the math methods. We have virtual invocations, which are calling a, a method on a concrete object, not against an interface. I have an array list in my hand. I want to call add to it. Uh, we, have an inter we have interface calls, where we're calling not against array list, but list. Uh, we're, not call we're calling runnable, an interface implementation. And we have what's called special calls, constructor calls, super calls, private calls. Uh, sort of hidden underneath the, the plumbing of the JVM, but they exist as another type of method call. And these all boil down to uh, four different bytecodes, invoke static, invoke virtual, invoke interface, and invoke special. And when you look at what these, these actually do, uh, a little bit of animation loss there, they largely do the same thing. They go and they look up a method, they probably cache it somewhere, maybe do some validation to make sure that we're not losing anything with our, uh, make sure that we're running against the same type, calling the same method every time. But it's all kind of the same, these four methods. And down at the bottom, we want to make invoke dynamic be a smart invoke, an invoke that can do anything. We need to figure out how to do that. So we'll animate, we'll show this a little bit more uh, graphically. Over on the right-hand side, we're going to represent the JVM as a telephone switchboard. We've got method calls coming in. They need to go to a method body somewhere. The JVM figures out how to route those, just like a telephone call. Uh, so we have our invoke dynamic bytecode at the top. Going left, our invoke dynamic bytecode will call back up to the language. So in this case, it'll ask JRuby, how do I find this method? JRuby will build the method handles, those function pointers, pass it back to the JVM, and those eventually point to some target method. It allows us to say how this lookup happens, how we find the method to call. 
And the magic is that the JVM can then turn this into a direct call. It can actually call that method directly, not have to call into our logic, and it optimizes like a real Java call. Rather, we have, whether it's dynamically typed, whether we have to look it up from a different object, just like a Java invocation, it optimizes very well. So back to our list of different types of invocations. Down at the bottom, now we know what we kind of want for invoke dynamic. So invoke dynamic will call back to our code, call back to user code in the language in your, your application. Your language will tell it how to find the target method and then plug it back in so the JVM can actually do the call like a Java call. Basically lets us configure uh, on our own how the JVM does method invocation. So JRuby on Java 7 now, with using invoke dynamic, using this, this great new way of making method calls, we can eliminate all of our logic in there. The JVM can see through that and we get straight through calls, just like it was regular Java invocation. And all of those cool optimizations we were missing out on, like inlining, like, we, like the optimizations we want the JVM to do for Ruby, will actually work. And we can optimize it just as well as Java. So how well does this work? Well, the blue bars here are JRuby without invoke dynamic, compared to regular Ruby, regular C Ruby. Uh, and we're faster, generally faster, but not as fast as we'd like to be. JRuby within the red bars here is using invoke dynamic. Uh, two and a half, three times, four times as fast as the C implementation of Ruby. And these numbers are continuing to get better every day. Uh, so JRuby, certainly the fastest way to run Ruby on any platform, and a large, of it, a large part of that is because of invoke dynamic and what it gives us. Another benchmark I like to show, this is a, a red-black tree implementation. At the top, we have CRuby, the C implementation, running a pure Ruby red-black tree. A little further down, the second bar, we've got Ruby running a C implementation of that same red-black tree. Uh, Ruby folks sometimes have to use C to get good performance. Down at the bottom, though, we can see how much Invoke Dynamic has helped. This is JRuby running a pure Ruby code, a pure Ruby red-black implementation, actually beating C Ruby with C code for all of that. Very impressive. And this is all, again, because of the JVM and because Invoke Dynamic has allowed us to talk to the JVM better. So what does Invoke Dynamic mean, bottom line? It definitely means faster dynamic languages. So if you're using Groovy or Ruby or Python or JavaScript on the JVM, you're going to have much better performance with Invoke Dynamic now. It actually improves support for future languages and language features. It makes it easier to expand Java. Now we don't just have those four invocation types. Even Java can do more complicated things. And it's starting to be used for Java features too. All right, moving on to the next section talking about Ruby calling down into native code. Uh, Ruby kind of is synonymous with Unix calls. A lot of what's in Ruby is, is tied up with the way Unix works, with the way POSIX APIs work, calling down to processes, calling I.O. Unfortunately, we're on the Java platform, and the Java platform is the Java platform is the Java platform everywhere we go. You can't make it look like Unix very easily, because that's not the point. You want it to look the same everywhere. So how do we do this? We need to make Ruby, JRuby compatible with Ruby, which has a lot of platform-specific behavior, but on a platform-independent runtime. Here's an example from uh, Ruby's own APIs. This is a list of all of the Erno exceptions. Uh, if you've ever done any C programming, you'll recognize some of these. We need to be able to support these and have the same list of C errors as exceptions in Ruby. Uh, an example of APIs that we need to be able to support. Ruby has the ETC, Etsy module, uh, and you see functions in here like get login, get password entry, uh, for getting a, 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 your login information or your group and information on a Unix platform. These are standard APIs in Ruby, and they're used by Ruby applications. No way that we can easily pretend to have these APIs on the Java platform. We really need to be able to call down to the C code to do it. And so that brings us to our, big, our, our, our next big challenge for JRuby. At some point, we realized we were just going to have to be able to make native calls uh, to have better process control, to have better I.O., to be able to support password entries and file system access. So how do we do this? How do we do this on the JVM? 
Well, if we look at what the JVM world looks like today, we have our isolated world up at the top, the JVM world, and then there's this, this messy world down at the bottom we don't talk about, the native calls, file system APIs, graphics APIs, operating system APIs for integrating with the desktop, for example. And in between here, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. We don't have any clear way of getting through that boundary. Uh, so the standard way, oh, here's, the, here's a quote from John Rose. So John Rose is one of the JVM engineers, and he believes that we need to make that a little easier. We need to make it easier to call from Java code into any library, whether it's a JVM library or not. If non-Java programmers find some library useful and easy to access, it should be similarly accessible to Java programmers. We should be able to use the same libraries that the rest of the world does, even if they don't use Java. Uh, so an example here. One of the simplest things that we needed to be able to do on JRuby was to call getPid to get the current process ID. And it turns out that there's almost no way to do this on the JVM. There are some hidden internal APIs that you can call that will return a string that happens to have the PID in it, and you can parse that string. Obviously very fragile. We don't want it to depend on that. We would like to just be able to call this. And looking at the man page here, it's such a simple thing. It just returns a PID T object, which is an integer. It's a very simple C call. How do we do this on Java right now? We use the wonderful JNI. Has anybody here done JNI programming, native interfacing from Java? All right, there's a few folks. And you really liked it, right? Really enjoyed doing JNI. No, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible world to live in. OK, so, so let's walk through how JNI actually works. We write some user code at the top. We've got user code that needs to make a native call. Uh, we write the JNI logic, the, the JNI interface essentially in Java. Uh, and then somehow under, underneath there, it needs to call the native code. We need some C code here. It starts out looking really simple. OK, native long get PID. OK, no problem. Uh, it's, it's native. Now I know I'm calling down into C code. This isn't that bad. I can do this. In the static block here, load the library, which is probably going to be our get PID library for JNI, or, or maybe we want to just load get libc. We want to call, load some C library so we can call this function. Uh, but then it, it gets worse. It gets worse from there. So we have to generate all this nasty C code that goes along with it. Uh, and you need to be, if you want to call just a simple get PID on the JVM, you would kind of need to be an expert in writing C code as well. That's not what we want for the platform. So we get wonderful header files like this, we get wonderful function names that represent the Java package and the name of the function that we're actually calling. And all we really want to do is call get PID here. All of this ceremony around it. But wait, it even gets worse than this. So once we've written our C, we still have to figure out how to build it on all the different platforms. And you know, I had to look this up to even know how to build this and what flags to pass. And this is just one platform. This is just building it on my uh, Mac here. If I want to build it for Linux, if I want to build it for Windows, all of this is different. So either I need to do that work for my users, or my users are going to have to do that work every time they move to a new platform. So obviously, there must be a better way to do this. All I want to do is call get PID. And that's why in the JRuby project, we introduced uh, something called the Java Native Runtime. Uh, the Java Native Runtime is a Java API for calling into native code. Uh, supported by a rich runtime that does all of that logic for you, all of that work in the native side, and most of the work on the Java side, too. Uh, some of you may have used JNA, a very similar library, uh, not quite as full-featured as JNR. Uh, and this is an example of a foreign function interface, a way of calling functions that are foreign to this platform, in this case, C, C++, and so on. Uh, and there's a project page if you want to go look at JNR for yourself. So let's walk through how JNR works. We have our JNI example. And the big problem here is that we have to write all of the code that's in purple color here. We don't want to have to write that. All we really need is what's at the top. We want to make that call to get PID. All this extra ceremony. So what JNR allows you to do is just write your user code, just your code up at the top. It generates the Java binding for that function. It generates the C binding for that function at, dynamically at runtime. And then it calls and loads that library for you. So to get our get PID, all we really need to do is say, I've got an interface. 
It's going to have a get pid function in it that returns a long here. Uh, we want to load a library. Uh, so library loader dot create our get pid class. We want a get pid implementation. We're going to load the C library because that's where get pid lives. And then we can call it. And that's all we have to do. There's no C code involved. There's no make files involved. So any C library that's out there, operating system features, crypto libraries, graphics, you can call them using JNR. And now, of course, a lot of these functions are going to be used again and again by many people. Uh, it would not make a whole lot of sense if we each used our own getpid implementation when everyone needs the same thing. So we built a project called JNR POSIX. Uh, JNR POSIX basically binds a whole bunch of common functions ahead of time for you. So getpid is in there, some IO operations are in there, the basic operations that you would have done in a, a C course in, in university. We've got them all bound already, so you can just get this object and call them. Uh, a small snippet of these, here we have chmod, chown, uh, features that are still not fully supported, even with current Java file system APIs. Uh, killing a process, sending a signal to it. Uh, getting the priority of a, a process, increasing it or decreasing it at the operating system level. There's our get pit, all ready to go. Uh, waiting on a number of processes, if you have a number of processes that you've launched and want to wait for. Uh, getting the current error that's actually happened at the C level. Hundreds of these functions that we've bound already for you, and all you need to do is say, POSIX factory, give me a POSIX instance, uh, make sure that it's calling into native code, and I've got get pit. So even easier than just binding it yourself. And a whole bunch of other functions available for you. And now we've also built other features on top of this. We've got JNR extended native cross-platform IO. Ooh, mouthful. Uh, so JNR ENXIO is basically an NIO wrapper, a Java IO wrapper around any native file descriptor. So we can implement things like subprocesses. We can implement things like unusual socket types that the JVM doesn't support. All still fitting into the Java platform and supporting selection, I.O. channels, all of the things that you're used to doing with I.O. On top of JNR ENX I.O., a perfect example of using this, Unix socket support for the Java platform. A library you can just pull into your project, you get a Unix socket that looks just like any other Java I.O. channel, but you can call out to a MySQL, a Postgres, that are listening only on a Unix socket somewhere. So how well does this perform? This is always a question we get from the, the JNI C folks uh, that want to be able to write C but not write it in, uh, write it in native code, basically. Uh, so we've worked very hard to make the performance of JNR good. Uh, the code in the, in the JNI side, the native side, is all generated for you. Uh, the native bits that actually call the function are generated in assembly code at runtime. Uh, and we generate all of the Java code that leads up to that. So ideally, from your user code, there's only one or two hops to actually get to a C function in a library. Pretty good. It's just about as fast as we can get it at this point. Uh, and looking at performance-wise, the first, the pluses here are JNI performance. JNR can actually beat JNI just slightly because of the generated code, because we can eliminate some of that extra boilerplate C code that goes in there. But obviously, we're not doing as well as we'd like here. Down at the bottom, we see a, a regular C program calling get pid uh, many times in a loop. Not as fast as, uh, we're, we're certainly not as fast as C code using JNI, but as good as we can get with JNI, JNI right now. So the next JVM feature that we need to do, we need to make this fast. We need to make it possible to call from Java code or Ruby code into a native library just like it was written in C. And that's where Project Panama comes in. Project Panama actually adds support for FFI, for native calls, to the JVM. If any of you have ever done .NET, it's similar to the pinvoke feature, to be able to call a native function from managed code, from .NET code. Now we'll finally have this on the JVM. Uh, it also supports generating all of the bindings for a given library. You point it at a header file or a C library, it'll generate all the Java code you need and wire it up for you. So let's take a look at how this fits into the system. So here we have our JNR example again, and we've done a lot of work to make this fast, but there's still a lot of layers, a lot of complexity. Probably the worst one here is the fact that we still have to call across JNI. 
and JNI has a lot of overhead, considerably more overhead than a normal C call. With Project Panama, what we can do is our user code calls into Panama, Panama binds that library directly into the JVM, directly into the compiled code, and our call from user code goes directly to the C library. It skips all of the JNI overhead, skips all of those intermediate layers, and the JVM knows how to optimize it, just like a C compiler would. And so what we end up with in the generated assembly, when we actually compile it, the JVM compiles our Java code down to assembly, machine code, we can actually see our Java code or our Ruby code is calling directly into that library at the C level. Absolutely as fast as we can get it and pretty much the same as doing it in C, a C program. All right, so Project Panama and JNR uh, are going to give us native calls directly to C. With Project Panama, with the new FFI work in the Java platform, we can make those calls actually be as fast as C. Very exciting that we can do that. So any graphics library you want to call, we're not going to have the overhead of calling through JNI. You can use it just like you were writing in C++. Also, we'll generate all the bindings. So take a header file, spit out a bunch of Java code. Now we can call that library without any overhead, without manually writing all of those bindings ourselves. And ultimately, allow us to use any native libraries that are out there very easily without having to write C code, without having to read C header files. We tell it where the library is, and now we can call it as if it was a regular Java library. So it's basically bringing C and C++ to the Java platform in a very nice way. All right, the last area I'm gonna talk about here. I mentioned that Ruby is a, a very heavy object language. Everything's an object, and boy, do they create a lot of objects in Ruby. Tons and tons of objects. So we need to find a way to make this perform well. Uh, I've found over the years that allocation is kind of the root of all evil. Whenever you go to optimize an application, nine times out of ten, the problem is that you're allocating too much. Uh, some applications you can't avoid it, certainly. But for a typical application, you're optimizing some algorithm. Usually there's too many objects being created. That's the first thing to fix. And that was our experience with JRuby. Uh, this is a chart of JRuby versions over time, uh, JRuby 1.0 or so. Uh, being about 10 years ago when we started this whole process. Uh, and you see the big jump here, or the big improvement in performance, the drop in time for this red-black tree benchmark. Uh, and this was actually because in JRuby 1.0, we had some massive object allocation problems, creating way too many objects internally for Ruby structures, not optimized as well as we'd like. Uh, this is a listing of some GC output from this benchmark. Each iteration would take 8.1 seconds. During that time, as many as 30 garbage collection runs would execute. Uh, sometimes, as in this second set here, a full GC run of the entire JVM heap just to run this simple benchmark. Uh, obviously, we were doing something wrong here. Now, this is kind of a hard problem to fix in Ruby. Uh, Ruby has closures, lambdas like Java. Uh, but they allocate extra space in memory. They have to hold all that, that extra, the extra variables somewhere. Uh, all numbers are objects. Uh, so every time you're doing a numeric algorithm in JRuby, it's creating lots and lots of new objects all the time. Uh, all the call paths require uh, references on the JVM. So we can't use primitives and objects interchangeably. We need to just use objects. That adds to our overhead. And then you have code like this, where maybe we're going to just use this quick structure to create an array of three objects, uh, turn, get the string value of each of those, sort them, and then get the first one. Lots of uh, intermediate objects created there, multiple arrays in there, uh, lots of strings that are created, all to find out which is the first one. And this is not uncommon in Ruby, because it's very simple code. But we want to be able to optimize this well, too. Uh, so here's an example that's actually a little bit closer to you all. This is a, a simple bubble sort implementation in Java. Uh, so we have an int array of numbers uh, and some comparator, depending on how we want to sort this array. Uh, we'll iterate over all of these elements in the for loop here, uh, and then call our comparator, and based on the comparator, do our bubble sort swap. Uh, computer science 101, basic stuff here. But there's a problem here. This comparator call is a generic function, a generic interface. Here it is uh, defined in the JVM, in the Java platform. Uh, so we have our generic T, uh, our T type here. But as we know, on the JVM, all generic types get erased to object. 
And that means that this compare call, for every number we're passing into it, it has to create an object out of it. It has to create an integer object. So we've got all these extra integers that are created and thrown away. Java escapes some of this object overhead that Ruby has, but not always. Generics get to be a very difficult problem whenever you're working with primitives. And that's where escape analysis comes in. So escape analysis is a feature in the JVM uh, that will examine a piece of code and any methods that it calls. And if it can see that an object is only used within this method or within these few methods that are all together, it won't allocate the object. It'll just avoid allocating the object and only use the data that's inside it. So in this case, our compare call, we can see that we're calling compare, we're passing integers into it, uh, even though we might be using them as objects on the other side, we don't need those objects. All we need is the integer value. And the JVM can optimize those objects away. As long as it all fits together, as long as it's a direct call like this, it'll optimize. We don't need to allocate those integer objects. Uh, now, that sounds great. So the JVM is able to get rid of all these objects for us. When an object isn't necessary, it will remove it for us, right? Well. Not always, not always. Here's a little bit more complicated example. Um, we've all done, uh, we've all used uh, the standard collections with primitives at some point. And of course, since the collections, you can't generify on primitives, you can't have a map of int to int, we need to use integer to integer, or long to long, or an array list of floats, for example. And now, of course, in this case, there's nothing the JVM can do to help us. We're creating a map. The map implementation here is mapping integer objects to integer objects. And the implementation internally, again, turns into a table of node objects. Those node objects have to hold objects. It's just much too deep for the JVM to even see that we really want to just map ints to ints, primitives to primitives. And so this is where Project Valhalla comes in, the last feature I'm going to talk about. Project Valhalla is a new feature coming uh, not in the next version of Java, probably the one after, uh, to actually finally reify generics. You might have heard this term, reifying generics. Uh, the long story short, it'll allow us to use primitives in generics and actually have the performance of an int array or an int to int map, just as if we wrote it by hand. We don't have to have the custom code. Uh, an additional feature here is that it'll also have value types. So these really cheap boxes like integer, long, float, the object types, we can say that they don't need to be regular objects on the Java heap. They don't need to weigh down the garbage collector. Now we can actually tell that to the JVM. So here, with Project Valhalla, we can take our map. We can actually say we want to map ints to ints. And internally, it will actually use integer arrays. It will not use a whole object type. It will not create those extra objects for us. And we can get similar performance to C++, C++ templates, handwritten, uh, handwritten collections, real primitives all the way through. Excellent stuff. So escape analysis does give us better elimination of unnecessary objects. Uh, this is, is still a work in progress, but it's improving over time. Uh, Valhalla will allow us to specify that certain objects are temporary so that they aren't weighing down the system. They're not taking up all that overhead. Uh, and finally, finally, we will, with Project Valhalla, we'll be able to create real collections of primitives, really use generics with primitive objects, and have it perform like we expect it to. All right, so when do we get all of these cool features? Well, so Invoke Dynamic was released in Java 7, and it's had continuous improvements in Java 8 on into Java 9. Uh, we're seeing great benefit from it in JRuby. Uh, the JVM itself is actually using, or Java itself is actually using it for some Java features now. Uh, so Invoke Dynamic has not only made it possible for Ruby to run well, but it's made possible for Java to grow as a language. Project Panama, the FFI support at the JVM level, uh, is coming along with, with bits and pieces in Java 9, uh, probably a full API, a JSR, in a Java 10 timeframe or so. Uh, the Java native runtime, however, is available today. JNR organization on GitHub, if you want to use it. There's Maven artifacts out there. We pre-build it for a whole bunch of different platforms. So you can start calling into C libraries today and start using the Project Panama JVM support pretty soon. Uh, again, a bonus here. This is made possible by Invoke Dynamic. We can say that we're doing a native call. It's bound with Invoke Dynamic. Java calling C directly. 
Uh, escape analysis uh, is on by default as of Java 8, uh, so you should see it on small pieces of code. You should see it eliminating some of those objects and performance will improve. Uh, big improvements are coming for Java 9. Uh, it's fairly limited in what it can do in Java 8, uh, but the JVM folks I know, like John Rose, some of the others at Oracle, they tell me that they think they're gonna get it right this time. They're gonna make it work for a lot more cases. Hopefully escape analysis will, will expand and, and cover many more uh, scenarios in the future. And then reify generics and value types, and Project Valhalla work. Uh, we are working on this uh, in the expert group right now. There are early prototypes available. So if you look for OpenJDK Valhalla, there are binary builds available you can start to play with. Uh, looking for a release probably in a Java 10 timeframe. So we've got a lot of things to look forward to here. And again, this is made possible by Invoke Dynamic. Invoke Dynamic can say, I actually want a map from int to int. The code is generated by the JVM, and we have our fast collection. All right, so the bottom line, the JVM these days is changing faster than ever. We're getting two or three major changes to Java and the platform in every release coming up, and it's going very quickly. You can get involved in this stuff. JNR, as I mentioned, is out there. Invoke Dynamic is available in current JVMs. Builds of Project Panama, the FFI stuff, and of Valhalla are available for you to try today on openjdk.net. And it's, it's a lot of fun to see that all this work is going on. There's a lot of cool new things that are being done on the Java platform. You can start playing with these tools and help make the platform better, help expand it into the future, and take the JVM into the future. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? All right, we have a few minutes for questions. Anybody? Yes, up here. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are so many Android apps and developers out there, so it has its own ecosystem and a virtual machine. So how do you think uh, is that maybe get behind the development of the JVM? Right, so the question is about Android is a big platform out there, its own ecosystem, lots of apps, lots of work being done, uh, but not really keeping up with what's going on with all the new JVM features because it's not a JVM. Um, so Android is, is an interesting problem. Uh, Android took mobile Java forward very quickly. It, it, it brought jo mobile Java back to life after Java ME kind of died out. And now, four years later, we're kind of the same place we were. Android has become the Java ME that's lagging behind. It doesn't necessarily have all the API support and certainly doesn't have some of the newer advanced JVM features. Uh, my hope is that someday Oracle and, and, and Google will be able to get together, figure out how to get these features onto the platform. I know that the Google folks are trying to improve it. They've got some Java 7 APIs in the more recent versions of Android. Uh, but it's a difficult problem. Uh, the good news is that we do want to support Ruby on Android, Ruby on other mobile systems. Uh, so folks are working on that. There's a, a project called RoboVM that we're looking into that's been, been very successful that actually is a JVM, uh, a real JVM, pre-compiled with your application for Android applications, for iOS applications. Uh, the existence of RoboVM, the fact that it's out there, I think will show Google that people do need the latest Java features, Lambda's new cool Java stuff that's coming along, and hopefully in the next couple versions of Android we'll see those features come along. I hope so. I, I, I wish I knew what was happening within Google, but I'd, I'd really like to see Android catch up with all this cool work. Other questions? Way in the back. Hi, um, I saw, uh, I recall the, uh, there's a, you had a, a performance chart that compares with the, uh, the performance of JRuby running on the new, new Java and old Java. And it seems that in both cases, uh, they somehow outperformed the standard Ruby, uh, if I remember correctly, and I, and I wonder why it is. Uh, you want to know why it is that we perform, outperform standard Ruby? Correct. Okay, well, lots of reasons for that. Uh, so the standard Ruby implementation uh, is, it is a virtual machine, but it doesn't have a JIT compiler. It doesn't turn Ruby into native code. That's a really tough thing to write, and so they haven't tackled that problem yet. 
by virtue of being on the JVM, we get a JIT for free. We get an excellent garbage collector for free. So we have all the benefit of these, the, the platform itself. Uh, now we've also tried to uh, spend a lot more time on optimization. We know how the JVM works. We know how to feed it code that it can optimize. So we've taken more time to work with Invoke Dynamic, work with other tricks in our, our class structure and how we design Ruby. Uh, we share a lot of this with the C Ruby implementers. Uh, and actually, I'm a, I'm, I'm a committer on the C Ruby project as well. Uh, but they are kind of limited in what they can do. The implementation is 15 years old now. Uh, even the new runtime is uh, almost 10 years old at this point. Getting to JVM level performance is, is, a, is a big challenge for them. Uh, but we, we, we really we work with them all the time. We share what we're trying to do. Uh, and they still manage to improve performance every release, too. Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes, I think. Oh, one up here. Yes. Yep. Uh, how do you prove the concurrency behavior is, oh, is the same as Ruby runtime? Ah, or concurrency this, and Ruby. OK. So background here, C Ruby uh, does run native threads, but it can't run Ruby code in parallel. Uh, you might be able to make an I.O. call, and then another Ruby thread would run. But normally, everything is locked down, uh, the global uh, interpreter lock or global VM lock. So normally, Ruby is a single-threaded runtime. Uh, on JRuby, obviously, we're using Java threads. We're using, and they, they use native threads. So JRuby is the best way, probably the only real way, to get high-performance Ruby and parallel execution uh, of Ruby applications. Uh, and there's been some tricks involved. We've had to work on thread-safe structures that Ruby never really thought about. We've had to build libraries uh, similar to Java Util Concurrent for the Ruby platform. And we've had to do a lot of educating in the Ruby world and teach people what thread safety is, how to write good parallel programs, how to write good concurrent code. Uh, we don't try to s pretend that we're single thread. That's probably the biggest thing. We allow Ruby threads to run concurrently in parallel. We allow it to use all of the, the, the resources of the system. And uh, you know, it, there's challenges along the way to making it really parallel. But we've done a lot of that research and a lot of that work. Uh, and it, it works very well. If you want to run Ruby on a multi-core system, there's really nothing better to use than JRuby at this point. Um, but, but does this mean that if I have a Ruby library, it might be thread, it might be data racing in the JRuby world? Right. So that, that is a possibility. So, so you mentioned that if you have a Ruby library and you bring it to JRuby, maybe it won't be thread safe, maybe not. Uh, that is certainly a problem. Uh, that has been more of a problem in the past, uh, as it was in early Java years when Java was not all that concurrent, didn't have good concurrency tools. Uh, but we've spent the last five, ten years building the right tools, building locking structures, building thread pools, building safe uh, collections, safe lists, safe hashes. Uh, most people that build their applications now or build their libraries for Ruby know about JRuby, know about these libraries, and plug them in, and, and they're generally thread safe. It's become much less of an issue over the past few years. All right, I think that's probably it. Thanks very much.